Sometimes people agree with us and sometimes people don't. Thank you. Uh, it's true. I'm glad you're here. You live here? Wakefield. Wakefield. Hello, Vern. How are you? Are you a handshake or two cups of coffee? I can. That's good. Uh, uh, we're still getting this Satisfactory to the most uh, of the tasting pastry. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? All right, good. I'm they worried. are. They should be. I'm, I'm worried that we're intruding. That people will start in the door and walk out. All right. I'm going to choose this end of the uh, You're standing here. It'll be helpful to you. But it's also closer to the door for me. <laughs> Although my wife has told me never stand in front of a window with the sunlight coming oh, through because it goes right through your hairline. Uh, so I'll try to find the shadows. Uh, oh, come on in. You'll, you'll, you'll make me nervous. <laughs> this lady just wants to be a You're customer. wondering why we came in here. Now I... We gave some thought to moving from the tasty pastry when we expected a larger audience than normal. Uh, I'm Jerry Moran. I'm glad to be back in Clay County. The tasty pastry has been uh, uh, a place that we've had uh, conversations and town hall meetings for as long as I've been elected official. I represented Clay County as a congressman, so for uh, a long time we've been having the tasty pastry as our host. But I was worried that just as I fear might happen is that people who just want a cup of coffee and a donut will walk in the door and decide they're not going to spend their money. So you all could help overcome that if you will spend. I'm told by a kid I know from Hayes, Gary Shoreman, that you want to get a nut roll. His dad comes here every day and gets a nut roll. Uh, so I would encourage that. Uh, I also think back to our town hall meeting in Palco, population 350, uh, in which there was 150 people at the town hall, 95% of them outside of uh, Rooks County, outside of Palco. And uh, I went back a week later and walked Main Street for an hour and a half so the folks of Palco and Rooks County could have a conversation with me. 
And what I discovered is they were delighted that we had all those people there. The local convenience store sold out of chicken fried steaks. Uh, that was the town hall meeting we had, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Politico, and a German television station. Uh, and they had discovered, I assume, some of them for the first time a chicken fried steak. Earlier in the week, we were in uh, Frankfurt for a Marshall County town hall meeting. And uh, after I left, I had an email uh, from folks saying, thank you for having your town hall meeting here. Uh, Elsie Grace says, yes, yes. sold out of uh, pies and, uh, and fudge. So please uh, take advantage of the tasty pastry. As has been my practice, is that as good as comfortable as it gets? <laughs> well, there's more people coming in, so. Um, I understand we have a high school class here. I don't know exactly where they all are, but we're glad you're here. Uh, and um, I visited your high school numerous times. You all look too young for me to have been there when you were there. But uh, we spent a lot of time visiting schools across Kansas. Uh, Representative Swanson is here. I don't know whether there are other state legislators here or not. Uh, and I can guess what uh, Susie has to tell me, which is remember what's transpired in Kansas when it comes to taxes. And uh, we'll have that. conversation I'm quite certain I want to mention in this case in this community three things uh, first of all this is a community that is very uh, military oriented uh, very supportive of Fort Riley a lot of military retirees and veterans live in Clay County and uh, first of all we thank you for your service secondly we would tell you that if there's any way we can be of help to you uh, as you deal with TRICARE on the military retiree side or on veterans issues uh, please ask us to do that, and, and I would highlight for you, this is a week I return to Washington, D.C. On, on Sunday or Monday, and we will be engaged in a number of topics, but one of the things that happens in December is the CHOICE program expires. This is the law that we passed three years ago that says if you live more than 40 miles from a VA facility or it takes the VA more than 30 days to provide the service, then you at your choice as a veteran can have that those services provided at home. You can see your hometown doc, you can be admitted to your hometown hospital. It's been implemented in a way that's very hard for veterans to, to make this work. The VA didn't like this law, and uh, at least initially they worked hard to make sure it didn't work, in my view. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time trying to make certain that people who are entitled to services from the VA can access that care. My husband used it and it's great. Good to hear. This lady's husband used it and it's great. And we think of that, incidentally, I've, I've, there's 127 hospitals in Kansas. I've been in each one of them. I've been in yours in Clay Center numerous times over the years. I haven't seen it since the new, new construction is completed. I was there for the construction. <clears throat> but this choice program is also valuable to the rest of us who are not veterans in that if we can keep veterans at home utilizing the services here, it strengthens the local health care delivery system. Uh, just like our schools need every student, uh, our hospitals need every patient, and so if we can get this program to work uh, well, uh, it will be a great benefit for places like Clay Center. The 40 miles may come in to you, I don't know how exactly how far it is to the outpatient clinic in Junction City. 37. 37, so you got to live on the north side of town. <laughs> Ultimately, when my goal in getting choice reauthorized will eliminate the 40 mile rule and create different criteria if it's in the more, more so if it's just in the best interest of the veteran rather than it's whether you live 41 miles or 39 ought not be the, the total criteria on this topic so help us help you as veterans or if you know a veteran secondly on the military side uh, i now chair the military the, the appropriations committee that funds military construction we are doing that in part to try to get it also funds the va to get the va and the VA's problems, incidentally, are not money. The VA's problems are management and bureaucracy, uh, attitude and approach. But we're trying to make certain that uh, things at Fort Riley are well cared for and that Fort Riley receives the attention in, that it deserves. This community helped us convince the military several years ago about the value of Fort Riley and its support by communities. And I would take this opportunity to thank you for doing that. We'll have challenges. Uh, there'll be a BRAC. Uh, again, I would guess it's authorized. It takes place in, a, in future years in which the, we look at unnecessary military facilities. And the more we can do to make certain that Fort Riley has its support today, 
the brighter its future will be, and it's such a significant component of our community's economy in the area, but it also helps defend our nation uh, in very challenging times. And then finally, uh, I would just describe this as an ag issue, but it's more than that. I'm worried that this administration is going to withdraw from NAFTA, uh, and uh, with commodity prices in agriculture, I, th I think what will happen is uh, we'll, they'll announce a withdrawal from NAFTA, and I'm, I'm all for trying to negotiate a better deal. But the theory, I think, will be if we withdraw from NAFTA, then Mexico and Canada will be more likely to negotiate that better deal. Mexico is our largest purchaser of agriculture commodities in Kansas. And if we lose that market, uh, I think the administration's position is we are so important in agriculture here that no one could afford not to deal with us. Uh, I would raise the question of Brazil and Argentina and others who every day try to take markets away from us. And we better be very careful that we don't hello everybody, that we don't lose this relationship with Mexico and Canada. So negotiate a deal, try to get something better, update NAFTA, but we need agricultural organizations, farmers and ranchers to make certain that the Trump administration understands that trade matters. I was at, I, I spoke at uh, Kensington, a little town in Smith County, for Veterans Day. The grain, particularly corn, piled on the ground goes blocks long all along the railroad tracks with a grain elevator in the background, and it highlights for me a couple of things. Grain prices are low, we've got lots of supply, and for us to lose Mexico or Canada as customers would be a serious thing. The other thing is that uh, we've been working to get USDA and USAID, USAID is the food agency, uh, for our government to increase the amount of grains in our country's feeding programs around the world. We have five famines going on. What a irony, what a moral issue to see grain piled on the ground for blocks and know that people are starving. Uh, it's one of the things that I think we as Americans could do a lot better and it would actually benefit us financially, but we're also doing the morally uh, correct thing. Uh, I will return to Washington, D.C., as I say, I think on Monday morning, maybe Sunday evening, and um, taxes will be, uh, I assume, the topic. Uh, my, I suppose maybe the easiest way to say this, I am for some tax bill. I think that there are taxes you can cut that help create jobs. I'm interested in reducing the corporate tax rate, which will cause some of you or many of you to say I'm interested only in helping the wealthy. I have little interest one way or the other in the wealthy, but I do think that a tax code that encourages business to stay here and grow here is something we ought to try to pursue. I'm also cognizant of what people saw happen in Kansas, and I would tell you that Kansas is uh, I don't know if front and center is the right word, but there's plenty of conversation about Kansas uh, in the conversation in Washington, D.C. about taxes. Uh, and in my view, the goal is to figure out which one of those, this is my view, uh, the, which taxes you can actually cut that help create more jobs, better jobs, higher paying jobs, more secure jobs, and which ones don't do that. And I think the thing to know, that at least I think I know, is not all of them do that. And so... Uh, I want to work to make certain that what we do doesn't significantly or dramatically or even, uh, I don't know what the right adjective is, we don't want to increase the debt and deficit as a result of tax cuts, and we're going to try to figure out how you do that. And so I've had conversations while I've been home this week with a number of my colleagues about concerns about the, the debt and deficit and tax cuts. And how do we find the right balance that causes more jobs in the United States without running the, the national debt up? This is still a lot of conversation to be had. It's one of the reasons I'm having town hall meetings while I'm home over Thanksgiving recess. Um, and a lot of the conversation has really remained on health care. And again, it's not my preference that health care be dealt in taxes. I think they're both significantly challenging issues to, to address. And figure out good answers. Excuse me. I'm standing in the way of the donuts. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Um, and I'm, I, I, I hope that we can separate the issues between healthcare and taxes and deal with them separately. 
And I think that possibility still exists. And, and the reason I, I paused a moment, I think I learned this in my Frankfurt. You all today probably, at least the folks uh, who, who, some of the folks who are in Frankfurt says, well, they always want me to get to say, to the point which I say, well, therefore I will vote against the bill. I, I think what I fail to indicate perhaps adequately in Frankfurt is I am for a bill, I'm for an outcome, but sometimes Kansans tell me just do something. And the goal is not just to do something, the, do the goal is to do something well or better or to improve things. So it's... Yeah. it's uh, I think this is true. Politics is a lot easier if you're firmly in one camp or the other. And I don't find myself always that way. To some of you, to your chagrin, I'm not one way far enough or another way far enough. And I regret that that just creates lots of conversations that uh, you know people try to drag you to their side. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name's Robin Andersek. I'm a lifelong Kansan. The proposed tax bill makes tax cuts on millionaires and billionaires permanent. Yay! However, tax cuts that might trickle down to normal people expire in 10 years. How is that fair to the middle class? Uh, first of all, I don't think it is, and I've said that. Uh, whatever's permanent ought to be permanent on both sides of the equation. But I would tell you that th this will then perhaps contradict what I just conceded to you. I didn't think we were going to deal with individual tax rates. I thought when we started this process, we were going to figure out what are those taxes you can cut that would grow the economy and where the, where the middle class, where everyday folks like us would benefit is a better job, a higher paying job. Um, I figured we would deal with corporate tax rates and we would deal with the consequences that that then creates for pass-through organizations and we would leave individuals for another day. Part of the problem is that, and I, I think that then became perceived, that, that idea of mine became perceived as just taking care of the wealthy, so individual tax cuts were brought into the equation. Those, were, those tax cuts were to be paid for by eliminating certain deductions. The House eliminates a lot more than the Senate does, and I'm, I'm not yet convinced that Kansans, Americans, want to give up their tax credits and deductions for the lower tax rate. I don't know the answer to that question yet, but this tax bill is developing in a way different than what I would have thought we would be doing. Yes, ma'am. Well, following up on that, please, then, some of the deductions uh, that are going to be eliminated um, or uh, affiliated uh, aspects of this bill will kill universities. Um, taxing graduate student stipends um, when a graduate student may be making $15,000 a year, treating the actual uh, tuition remission as taxable income will compound student debt in ways that will injure the individuals, but it will also kill the university. Universities are major economic drivers. Of course, here we have Kansas State, which Purple is a major economic I know my audience. <laughs> <laughs> but it isn't just us. I mean, it's, it's other universities as well. And this will be catastrophic. One of the things we do well in this country that we actually export by bringing imports is bringing students from around the world to pay tuition and come to our universities. We break all the universities. We're breaking one of our major economic drivers. Um, I agree with you. The provision that you're complaining about is not in the Senate bill. Is in there isn't a Senate bill yet, but it's not. It's not in the outline of the Senate bill. It is in the House bill, and that kind of elimination of a tax deduction uh, or taxing income that isn't really uh, you don't really receive uh, doesn't make sense to me. And I share your view about the importance of uh, education generally, but uh, university education in your conversation. Uh, I have a. This has, I'll, I'll wander just a minute, but, but tell you why I, why I am sympathetic to your point of view. Uh, Kansas is an agriculture state, we're an oil and gas state, we're a, an airplane manufacturing state, we got a lot of service industries, uh, but I'd love to see this change, this state change and add a pillar to its economy in which kids who like science and mathematics and engineering and research have a future not only in being educated here, but in pursuing careers here. And I'm, I'm very interested to see this, 
This is more of a state issue than it is a federal issue, but it's a reason, for example, we worked hard to get NBAP built in Manhattan and the National Cancer Institute designation at KU and engineering improvements at uh, Wichita State so that we can capital, uh, capitalize on creating an environment in which science, mathematics, engineering is, is rewarded and there's an opportunity. I also would take this moment to say that I think we underemphasize community college and technical education. And for those of us who want to save rural communities, uh, it is a place in which there are significant opportunities for people in careers in places that we all call home. And so we got to get out of our, while, while I'm promoting science and engineering and technology, that can be at the university level, but can also be at the community college and technical level. And we need to get out of our mindset for our own kids and for as teachers and guidance counselors and others saying, if you want to be a success, you got to go off to some university. And when you graduate, you got to go off to someplace else. And that's a success. We need to see success in places like Clay Center and Wakefield and Clifton and Clyde, where the line is drawn now. Uh, so what are we going to do about that? What do we do about that? Yeah, what are we going to do about the fact that we're taxing graduate students and their stipends and their wagers and basically setting back the goal to increase 1 million STEM graduates by 2022? Well, I mean, completely the, I think the, destroying the, the question is what am I going to do about it is, one, it's only in the House provision of the bill, and so we will work to keep it out of, if there is a final version of a tax bill, uh, my goal will be to see that that provision is not included in that final version. Michelle is advocating for you. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> Will you go back to the Senate and tell them what didn't work in Kansas? Yes. The triple dot. Yeah. I've had numerous conversations, no reason to use the word we, the pronoun we. I've had numerous conversations with um, my colleagues, uh, with leadership of the, of the United States Senate, with members, with senators who are on the Finance Committee, uh, the Tax Writing Committee of the Senate, uh, about Kansas and what we can learn from that experience and how things could be different in a tax bill in Washington, D.C. You know, one of the things that Kansas did was to eliminate all taxes, all income taxes, on pastors. That resonated, that, 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 and what Kansas did was then seen in Washington, D.C. is, well, we're not going to do that. So while the tax code in Kansas takes those, that income, those income taxes to zero, the only thing that the federal tax bill, the, the, the one that Congress is debating does, is to try to make them more compatible between a C corporation and a, a corp an entity that's cor a corporately organized so there's not a disparity, and you don't pick your organization based upon the tax consequence. So, and it also limits the, you know, in Kansas at least, I think this is true, we, we heard, and I think it's true, that professionals would uh, become an LLC, they as an attorney or an accountant or whatever would not pay taxes while their secretaries would. We continue to tax individual income at its individual tax rate, it's not taken to zero for people who earn their living as really as individuals, not as a corporation. So there are, I, to answer your question really twofold, one, some of those conversations have occurred already and more will continue as we, as we figure out what the final version of a tax bill might look like. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, with the sheet pie under investigation, um, net neutrality in general, um, also the fact that there was a DOS attack on the uh, ability for citizens to go in and make their comments known to the SEC, and the fact that well over, I think it was 500 comments were falsely posted through other, uh, by false uh, means, not actual citizens. How do you plan to stop the FCC from passing the net neutrality bill, which will kill creativity? Um, First of all, I'm not for throttling, and I, I want a, an open internet. I, I, I guess my answer to your question is uh, that vote, I guess, will occur, although I'm, I, I, let me say it this way. I know a GPI and know him very well. Uh, the commissioner, the chairman of the F FCC is a Kansan. He's from Parsons, Kansas. Uh, he is very bright, uh, and uh, we've developed a good working relationship. What I would tell you is that, and so we have the opportunity to have 
conversations uh, easily. Uh, secondly, I would tell you that what is taking place as a result of what's going on at the FCC, and it started before even this latest development at the FCC, is the Republicans and Democrats on the Commerce Committee, of which I'm one, uh, are working to see if we can't pass legislation broad, broad, bipartisan, that deals with internet neutrality that is much more satisfying both to the competitive needs of the internet and to the freedom that individuals ought to have in accessing information off the internet. Uh, and I, I think this circumstance now causes Republicans and Democrats to have a significant desire, necessity, to negotiate a deal. So I would expect the Commerce Committee followed by Congress to actually have legislation that becomes law dealing with the issue of inter internet neutrality. So then, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, I'm very sympathetic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, can I, can, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. you got a second bite of that. Yes, sir? So, I want to tell you something that you need to know. There was a recent textbook that was just published about healthcare delivery from a professor at Harvard. It'll be in schools all across the country. And in the second to last page, you were mentioned in the book as voting against the DCRA, basically coming above um, you know, partisan lines and rejecting what was objectively a bad healthcare bill. Um, so you're immortalizing this textbook now as you know, saving the healthcare of us all. That and could I think, be good and bad. Yeah, so I, I think that we're in a very similar situation now with the tax bill in that you, know, you talked about you want to get something done, but there's a possibility that the bad things, that the hesitations you have about this bill could result in a worse standard of living for most of us um, than the good things about the bill. So my question is, since you know, the, this bill is as it stands, the proposal as it stands, is going to cause a huge deficit, um, it will increase taxes in the middle class after 10 years, it, for example, for the child tax credit, expands it for people making up to half a million dollars a year and it doesn't help poor people, it kicks a million immigrant children off the tax bill. Given that you have some of these concerns, will you please make a public statement saying that you have these concerns and then make your support of whatever becomes this bill conditional upon whether or not your colleagues meet these demands? I make my concerns uh, public. We're doing that right now. It, uh, my, my words, as you say, I even enter into a textbook. My words uh, get quoted. I'm told that. I, I was on NPR on uh, as a result of the Frankfurt town hall meeting. It's the only Republican having a town hall meeting, uh, and that I was willing to put up. With. It did cause me to to uh, kind of question NPR once again because there, Moran seems to be the only one willing to put up with Republican hate, hate of Republicans. I know that's exactly the way to say this. Although you all can applaud if you want to, to comment. Um, so, you, you have visited with me numerous times and been to, you know, a dozen of my town hall meetings. I'm happy to outline my concerns, uh, and ultimately I will make a decision as to whether or not I believe a tax bill or a health care bill or other legislation has more benefits than it has detriment. And we'll work through criteria. You've to you told me something at the town hall meeting in Marshall County that captures my attention because I was pleased that we were doubling the tax credit. This is an example of where these kind of conversations uh, matter, matter to me. Uh, I thought we were doubling the amount available to everyone. Your indication is we double it by increasing the income levels in which the tax credit applies. That makes a lot less sense to me than expanding the tax credit for people who are already at lower incomes. Mm -hmm. Assuming that you're telling me the truth, I wouldn't suggest that you wouldn't intentionally tell me the truth, but <laughs> assuming that what you're saying is true, then that's another opportunity for me to, to go to work to make certain that if we're going to then double the tax credit. why not have hearings? Why try to pass the bill? Yeah. 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 Why not have hearings? You know, if you want uh, to know. I'm all for that. And in this case, I actually think that this is the taxes a is different in magnitude than the health care bill. I think it's been a more it's been a far from perfect process, but it's been a more open process than the health care bill was. I think we would pass a better tax bill. I think we'd pass a better health care fix bill if it was a hundred senators all involved in the process. Now, you can, you, can, you can applaud that, and I mean, I, we would agree on that. 
But I also, I mean, again, this was a, this is sometimes a question. Will you agree that you will vote against a tax bill in which the Democrats aren't involved? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I understand why you'd ask that question, but I don't know that the Democrats yet want to be involved. They say they do. And I've had a number of Democrats come to me to say, we'll work with you to get a better tax bill. But I also have seen enough in Washington, D.C., both Republicans and Democrats, when President Obama was president, Republicans wanted to make certain that, that he didn't have successes. And I'm not unconvinced, that's a, a, an odd way of saying this, but to try to keep the, keep the facts straight, I'm not unconvinced that we don't have the same thing going on the other side in which Democrat senators will say they want to work with you, but their preference would be that nothing happens because then Republicans look even worse. And this becomes all about politics. Who wins the next election as compared to do we get a right tax bill? And so to, 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 take, to, to say you know, firmly that the only way I would vote for a tax bill is if it's a Republican-Democrat deal, I don't know that the Democrats are at this point interested in, in working together to solve that. I didn't hear him question. say Republican Democrat, though. I didn't hear him say that it had to be Republican uh, hearing Democrat. Hearings is what I heard, right. right. And at least the, the, the Finance Committee would say they had committee hearings. It broke down into a bunch of Republican and Democrat bickering. Uh, again, more information is a good thing, and taking our time, I said this earlier, just to do something is not the goal. In fact, it... it okay. I have lots of Kansans who tell me, if you guys can't get anything done, just do something to prove you can do it. And I, no. No, 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 I'm, I, and I'm saying that, that attitude, that attitude bothers me, but there's a real sense out there that just do something. And again, the goal is to do something better than what we have. Yes, sir. Um, as he, as this gentleman's asked, will you, will you publicly say that you will not vote for a tax plan that uh, increases, right, increases, well, ask is the rest of us to bankroll even more, right, the top 1%. The rest of us that don't make $722,000 a year, right, um, and won't see an average increase of $7,150,000 per year on their tax increase. And for the, those of us that are at the bottom, like myself, who worked in uh, aircraft, right, um, and got kicked and got laid off, then went to contingent work, and then that company got sold, and now I'm homeless um, while I'm looking for another job. And uh, so those tax cuts are going to come around and take the only thing that I have to survive, which are, uh, which is my EBT card, mm -hmm. right? To go and go shopping and groceries wherever I can get when I can get there. And there's there are hundreds of thousands of other folks right here in Kansas who live that life every day. And, and we say Democrat and, and Republican, this isn't a partisan issue, this is a people issue. Yeah. 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 People, like yourself, to put people first. Yes. 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 Um, Jerry, I totally agree with my friend here. You are our senator, and we are your people. Yes. I don't care if you are a Democrat or a Republican or a Libertarian or a Green. You represent us, and you have a duty of loyalty to your constituency to do what's right for our people. If they can just back to the side so our customers can get in and out, we'd really appreciate it. Okay, we're trying to do that. What we're saying, Jerry, is that somebody's got to put the skids on a tax bill that, according to the Joint, the Joint Committee in Congress, points out that within 10 years, the entire advantage will shift to entirely to people earning more than $200,000 a year. That does not happen to be the median income of your people. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So I think one of the other lessons from Kansas is that legislation passed in haste in the middle of the night, which is how the tax bill here got passed, um, without without a lot of hearings and without the real work that needs to be involved. And I know you understand what I'm saying when I say the real work that that goes on when when everyone hashes it out and gets to the and gets to a good settlement, a good compromise. Democracy. That is the that is beyond 
what happened after it was passed, that's the real lesson, is that legislation that's passed in Haines without adequate investigation into all the outcomes for it um, is, what, is what inevitably hurts all of us and, and can potentially um, not just cost us more money, but also the, uh, those of us at the lower end more money but also reduce our competitiveness in the world. You know, if we take away these grad students, there goes our competitiveness. Yes. Okay. Um, well said. Uh, so, sir? Well, sir? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me for having my back. I know, that's okay. I just, uh, to me, the President's tax, Trump's tax bill looks very similar to President Reagan's tax bill back in the 80s. I'm just wondering, are you expecting it to have the same results as President Reagan did? Well, uh, I wasn't around, uh, but, I mean, President Reagan, I was, I was alive, but I wasn't in, in Congress uh, during President Reagan's tax cut. But what I would say is that the, and it, it's happened before in which the taxes to, to, to be cut to, to increase the economy, to, to, to grow the number of jobs or the quality of jobs, also requires some fiscal discipline in which you don't keep spending money. Yay! <laughs> and that kind of discipline, you know, th this issue of tax cuts would be, uh, thank you, Your Honor, the issue of tax cuts would be easier to deal with if you actually had any faith that Congress would hold the line on spending. And so when we talk about a deficit, it is, it's, it's two components, is how much revenue you take in, and how much money you continue to spend. And again, I, I would like to see a tax cut that increases the economy. And I say that in large part because I've not seen the discipline of Congress in my time there to actually do anything about reducing spending. Uh, you know, we had the Bowles Simpson Commission that was came up with a plan that uh, was supposed to help us balance the budget. President Obama appointed the commission, and once its, its product was announced, nothing never pursued any further. There was a gang of eight, four Republican senators, four Democrat senators, who decided they could get together and figure out what revenues could be increased and what uh, spending could be cut. They finally gave up. I've not seen any evidence of even when we work together that there's enough willingness to reduce spending, and therefore your tax cuts need to be based, if, if, you, if you do believe that the debt and deficit matter, then your tax cuts need to be based upon tax cuts that will actually increase the revenue, not decrease it. And the point that people make here is about Kansas, that was the theory. We don't, people don't think it happened. And it did happen. We're losing jobs and people. And so the question is can we find taxes to cut to grow the economy? You don't can we cut taxes, invest in people, invest in small And still have, the, still have the resources to invest in people. How we spend money, if, if you don't believe that there is money being spent in Washington, D.C. that shouldn't be spent, I, I disagree with you. There is money that shouldn't be spent. That's true, and we ought to figure out how to prioritize. Yeah, the military budget needs to be cut. Inflated yeah. military budget. All right. Uh, with all due yeah, respect, just, can you just answer this man's question? Yeah, I don't think you ever answered his question. Uh, first of all, um, while I think there's waste and, and uh, too, if you don't think that things can be cut in the military budget, you're wrong, but if you think overall, that we don't have to spend more money to protect our country, uh, I disagree with you. Uh, this is an important component of protecting American lives. And so I just disagree with this idea that we can get all of our savings by cutting military spending. Yes, now ask the question again. Again, will you say that you will not vote for a tax plan that that does not, that well, you will not vote to a tax plan that only increases, only increases the wealth of the, of the top 1% in this country and in this state. In this state, the top 1% make over $700,000 a year. And I don't think anyone in here in this room is in that category. I'd actually love to add to what he's saying. So you're saying that you, let, you got let off your job and now you rely on SNAP. Yep. So what the, the budget shot that you voted for cuts SNAP food stamps, what he and his daughter are relying on right now, by $150 billion. The estate tax cut is also about $150 billion. So do you think the money that he goes to feeding him and his family should go to, say, Donald Trump's children? Because that's the, the equation that's that we're kind of working with right now. And I think that's what he's yeah. concerned about. Yeah. I voted on a tax plan yet. I don't budget think. Shell. Budget, budget shell. Budget shell. All right. Yeah, budget shell. Yes, sir? Um, let's get back to something around that this community is involved in, and that's production agriculture. And what do you see um, as the safety net 
in the next farm bill on the production end. Um, you, you are being very helpful to me, and I'm an idiot for going back to taxes, but I would, I, I would say this, and this is mostly in my conversation about uh, exports and trade. I've told people in Washington, D.C., including my colleagues, including people in the administration, and I've written an op-ed about this, that if we lose our markets and ag income diminishes from where it is today, tax cuts are not an issue. If you don't have income, tax cuts won't matter. And so don't take away 50% of our income. If we, if we lose our export market, 47% of the acres planted in Kansas are planted for purposes of selling what they grow on those acres outside the United States. So I've used the tax bill to highlight the mistake that it could occur. So the safety net, a safety net is to make sure that we continue to have markets around the globe, in my view, including Cuba, but NAFTA's front and center. We already lost uh, the other countries at TPP mm -hmm. have organized themselves and have reached an agreement without us. Those, in my, those things, in my view, are a mistake for agriculture and therefore for Kansas. But there is a farm bill underway. The most important thing that uh, Kansas farmers have told me now for a long time is not necessarily the farm programs, but to make sure we have a viable crop insurance program because we farm in a part of the world in which the weather is often not our friend. And the, the, the crop insurance program, it used to be that's how we would, re when I was in the House, the various organizations argued that we need to reform the farm bill and the reform was moving from programs to crop insurance. Now the people who want to reform everything have moved to attack crop insurance. It just followed us to what we, because over time we've reduced farm program payments, particularly direct payments. I don't think we have the safety net in place perfectly. Uh, that's a, not a very good choice of words. It's not adequate. It's timeless, it's poor in what we have today and when you choose between the two programs. And you get your money way too late. Now if I can also say when it comes to agriculture, this, this sounds like I'm changing the topic. But we have a real problem with the, I don't know whether we have any local bankers in the room, uh, but we have, we have a real problem with the consequences of Dodd-Frank, uh, in which the efforts to, to rein in Wall Street end up reining in Main Street. And in bad economic times, historically, when you talk about a safety net, the ability for a, a bank, a community bank, a community lender, to lend money to a farmer in difficult times, is a safety net that the rest of the country doesn't understand. Historically here, you've had banks that are locally owned and managed who know their customers and know even in difficult times, this is a safe loan to make because I know them and they will pay it back, even though on paper it doesn't look very good. And the banking regulations are in the process of taking away that individual judgment and consideration of character when it comes to making a loan. And the last thing we need in this agriculturally difficult time is do you, do you go to your banker and say, I'm sorry, I'd make you a loan. We've done this in the past. You paid me back. But the regulators no longer will let me make that loan because it doesn't fit their criteria. If your banks go kaput in Clay Center, that's a bad deal for Clay Center, but it doesn't shake the U.S. economy. And we have regulations in place that are trying to rein in decisions here and the only, a piece of good news, and you ask for bipartisanship, the, the, the banking committee of which I was a member passed out on a straight party line vote a Republican plan dealing with Dodd-Frank. When that happened, we immediately went to work to find Democrats on the banking committee and Republicans on the banking committee who would find something more in the middle that would be satisfactory to everybody but on the edges. And we've now come up with an agreement supported by eight Democrats in the Senate, eight Republicans in the Senate, including me, that deal with changing Dodd-Frank as it affects community banking. This is an agricultural issue, it's a future. I often have said in Washington, D.C., since I've been there, that where I come from, economic development could be whether or not there's a grocery store in town. And most of my colleagues, nobody knows what that, why that would be an issue. I greatly miss your grocery store being in Manhattan. Uh, we want those kind of facilities, those, those stores in places that are challenging. And while I talk about agriculture, one of my conclusions is whether or not a grocery store in town is often determined by whether or not there's a bank who will take a risk on a very risky business to help the community. And Washington, D.C. rules and regulations are harming uh, that cause. Somebody in the back? Thank you. Oh, no, you look too mean. You're holding a sign, aren't you? Sure, thanks. Oh, no, no, she is. Oh, she is.
No All right. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm like, I'm not holding a cell phone. I okay. agree with it. <laughs> oh, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> Senator, I want to thank you for doing this because you are. genetic disease. He was told he could get a transplant. Then the insurance company came back and said, you know what? We're not going to pay. So after trips to Mayo Clinic, after trips to KU Med, after thinking, thank God, thank God we have an app. The insurance company says, ha ha, we're not going to pay. Deny and die. And so what happens? I have to get a lawyer. I have to say to the insurance company, you have to do this. This is part of what you say you'll do, right? Long story short, he does. So I'm a widow. I have three kids. Now my kids are classified as maybe having a pre-existing condition. I'm trying to support myself and go to college. I'm working multiple jobs. I'm driving from Clay Center to Manhattan to Junction City daily and struggling to put food on the table and I'm working so hard to find health insurance because my kids may have a pre-existing condition. We have got, in this great country, and I've traveled a lot, in this great, great country, we have got to provide health care for individuals. Yeah. 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 
think. Except you say it again. Same story. Yes, sir. Same deal here. Um, I'll respond, and maybe I'll, I'll I'll cut my responses short so that more people can have a chance. It's a really thank you for thanking me for being here on a Saturday, but our Thanksgiving meal is today, oh. so I'm I'm uh, I, I have instructions not to be late today. <laughs> uh, our we're at a stage in life in which our our holidays revolve around whether or not our kids are home and when they're home. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for your comments. I agree that healthcare. Let me agree with you, and then others can can chime in. In, in their thoughts. I agree with you that health care shouldn't be in the bill. Um, I thought we'd put it to rest at least for a while, and it's hard enough to tax taxes, it's hard enough to fix the Affordable Care Act, and to combine them makes it more likely that nothing happens. And then, I'm sorry for the circumstances you find you found yourself in, find yourself in today. Uh, I am a believer that we have to find a way to cover pre-existing conditions, but I'm also, a, and I would say that while you're you're talking about your kids having a pre potentially having a pre-existing condition, there isn't anybody in this room who doesn't have a pre-existing condition. DNA will be tested, and insurance companies will know what uh, you have long before you may know what you have. We're all subject to pre-existing conditions, and it can't be an excuse for not having insurance coverage. I also, but let me speak for another set of folks who tell me that with the Affordable Care Act, their premiums are so high they cannot, uh, you don't believe it? Oh, I believe it. I don't believe it. I've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah. I just, I just signed up. Yeah. And I saved $500. Good for you. Um, I, I have too many conversations with too many people. Often when I'm walking out the door because you intimidate all of them, they'll say, please, please don't forget that my premiums have gone up 300% in the last two years. Um, say it again. It won't, say it won't get better. It won't get higher if we eliminate the individual mandate. That's how that works. It will. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Brand, thank you. Um, I want to ask you about another topic. Deals with taxes a little different. E-commerce, internet sales tax. I've written you a couple of times, and I don't know that a lot of people realize that in Kansas, we're required to pay our sales tax on internet purchases. We pay them voluntarily with the filing of our Kansas form 40 form. I don't think a lot of people realize that. So when you buy any item for Christmas off the internet, you're supposed to send your sales tax to the state of Kansas. But the laws are so confusing right now the state and the federal government both sort of blame each other that Kansas cannot receive sales tax directly from internet sales. And it is federal law that seems to prevent us from being able to do that because of some different variances, but I won't go into that. But my point is, is there anything being done at the federal level to help the state receive sales tax? Because the recent study done, the most recent was at the University of Tennessee study in 2012, and it said we're losing $280 million in sales tax in the state of Kansas annually, and it's only increased since then. So what's being done at the federal level to make Kansas eligible for sales tax on internet? Uh, I, I don't know that all of you heard what was said, but the point is that you are required by law today that if you purchase something on the internet, you pay sales tax on that purchase. And the point was also made, easier made by you than me, that you don't follow the law. <laughs> Many don't follow the law. And uh, the question then was, what are you doing about it in Washington, D.C.? First of all, I always have this caveat on this question, which is I'm not for taxing the use of the internet. But I am for taxing the purchases on the internet, in other words, enforcing the law that already exists. And so Congress has legislation that makes the collection, makes the opportunity for Kansas and other states to collect that tax much more accomplishable and much more enforceable, and I'm a, a supporter of that legislation. Uh, it was promised that there would be a vote on that bill. We, it hasn't happened. Uh, it uh, is thought of as potentially, it has the potential of passing, but it's also attacked as raising taxes, and that then creates a political environment that some folks are reluctant. So I, I'm giving the caveat, I'm not trying to tax the use of the internet, but I do believe we ought to make it easier for Kansas to collect, other states to collect, the tax that we already owe. And I care about this as a guy who cares about rural America in particular, uh, I actually think that property taxes are the most onerous tax we have. Uh, just because you own a quarter section of ground or a house doesn't mean you have the ability to pay the tax. And when we don't have sales taxes in communities like ours, a collectible, and as the movement is away from Main Street bricks and mortar shopping, 
This is damaging to our local units of government and their ability to have the revenue they need to do the things that we want them to do. And secondly, it creates a competitive disadvantage for somebody on Main Street on the square of Play Center versus somebody on the internet. And we want more businesses on Main Street. We want the grocery store in town, not purchased on the internet groceries. And I would encourage you to use this opportunity. This is someday shop something day in shop Play Center. Small. Shop small. Shop small. This is so shop buy small. Buy something while you're in Clay. There you go. <laughs> Gas or food? Yes, ma'am. I have a pro life <laughs> comment. If you stop legalized abortion, that will help you because you'll have more children. You have 60 million children. Oh my God. have been aborted. So do you want to adopt those that don't have homes? Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to do that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, on that topic. That doesn't matter. Uh, on yes, that. It does. <laughs> Shelter, food, or clothing. Uh, on that topic, the tax code provision in the Senate is to increase the support for adoption, not to do away with the adoption tax credit, but to encourage adoptions uh, as, a, as a financial incentive. Uh, we know that kids are expensive. Yes, ma'am, you had your arm up a long time. Yes, thank you. My arm was falling asleep. <laughs> Senator Moran, I'm here as uh, one of your constituents, but mainly as a concerned immigrant mother. Okay. And um, I want to talk to you about DACA. Uh -huh. As we all know, DACA was resigned recently. And the assignment was for Congress to do something about it, something about the 800,000 800, DACA recipients. Those are kids that already had background checks, that they already have um, jobs, that they're paying taxes. And now they're on the limbo. Over 22,000 of them are already risking deportation. Many of them are already being deported. Many of them are losing their lives. I'm from Wichita, we drove two hours to come see you today. I'm glad uh, I saw your arm up in the air so long. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for, for being here. But in Wichita, recently, we lost a young man, parent, worker, and he committed suicide. And one of the contributing reasons was the despair. We have fought for so long for a comprehensive immigration reform that will protect the people that already settled in this country and giving them a legal path to be a fully contributing citizen. When we were able to protect 800,000 youth who are the brightest and the best, because they have to, they, can, they are youth, but they cannot commit one mistake, because then that benefit gets taken away and they get deported. So my reason for being here is to ask, what are you doing or what are you going to do to ensure that these kids do not die coming back to this country because they have kids and families here? I'm glad to hear that you are a parent. So my question is, what will you be willing to do for those beautiful daughters of when, yours if when, this country was the one? Um, I am for a DACA fix, and I've said this publicly. I said it uh, when the administration changed the name. Willing to work with any of my colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, and the administration for a bill that uh, can be signed and into law. Uh, and my view is, just, if we're going to focus on immigration, we're focusing on we're focusing our resources on the wrong people. If we want to fix something about immigration, it's not about the issue of people who came here through no. Uh, I don't know, fault or not the right word, but not on their own volition. Not not a, they, not they came with choice. their parents, out of their choice. Thank you. And uh, so we ought to uh, do everything we can before the time deadline expires. There is at least conversation that there's going to be an extension of that time frame. I understand the uncertainty has to be terribly damaging uh, to people and their families. Uh, and I also think that uh, sending kids home to a country that they uh, have no real connection to is not a humane, not an American view of their American principle of the way that we, we look at, at, at life. And so um, I, I don't know more to say is that I think that uh, there's a, enough of us, and I know more about the Senate than the House, there are enough of us in the Senate who want to see a fix. I would also say just broadly about immigration, um, I'm of the view that we have a broken immigration system. Uh, the, the thing that our office will spend more time on is helping people who are in a circumstance with immigrants, more so than the tax code. 
People who contact our office contact us about an immigration problem. I sometimes think that we uh, broadly have, a, in, in the big sense, we have uh, you know, a certain view about immigration or immigrants. And then once we know people, the attitude changes. When you know somebody from church, somebody from work, somebody from school, then we want to help them. Now, we have to do things that doesn't, that doesn't encourage more illegal behavior, more people coming to the United States illegally, but I don't think the solution to that issue is uh, sending young, young people home who came here through no choice of their own. And I would say that uh, we need to figure out how many people our country can assimilate into the United States, what, what kind of people those are, what kind of tasks and abilities they can, can perform, uh, who benefits the United States. Uh, and then have an immigration system that checks out their security, checks out their health, and makes a determination within a short order of time so that if you are entitled to immigrate here legally, it's something that is accomplished in a matter of weeks or months, not a matter of decades. Most of the circumstances we deal with is there's some file on somebody's desk in Lincoln, Nebraska that hasn't been opened in 10 years. The system is broken. One more and then I gotta go. Uh, Susie. Yes, ma'am? I'm sorry. Did there, I? Is, there is several bills circulating around. One of them is the DREAM Act. If that gets bring to a vote, will you support the DREAM Act? I, I, I don't know all the details of the DREAM Act. What I would again tell you is that I will find, I will work to find legislation that can pass and become law that takes care of uh, the DACA kids. Can you meet with a group of uh, dreamers? There's about 16 requests on my, I do my own scheduling in Kansas, there's about 16 requests from across the Kansas and well, across you, Kansas and we're happy to meet. With a group. I, we have a coalition of dreamers that are from across the, the state in general, several different areas, rural areas in Wichita. Will you be willing to meet with I, I would them be willing to meet in December? With them. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know time, but I'm willing to meet with them. I'll get back to you. I wasn't trying to hedge on you. I don't know what's going on in Washington, D.C. in I'll December. Back to you no, there are, it may surprise you, but I spend mostly five days a week in Washington, D.C., and then what I have is generally weekends. We will need to, will need to travel yes, to Washington, D.C. As evidenced by today. Uh, Susie, would you, I know that I'm making a mistake here, but would you wrap this up for me? Well, I just want to ask you about the CHIP program, the Children's Health yes. 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 Well, yes, states are starting to shut their program uh, down. I read that in the papers, uh, paper. Um, I'm a supporter of CHIP. Uh, I don't understand the, the delay in the Senate. The House has now, pardon me, passed a CHIP plan. Uh, it will, my guess is it will be more controversial than what the Senate would pass. But we've reached out to Lamar Alexander, the chairman of the committee responsible for this, encouraging us to get it done. My impression is it will be included in a year-end spending bill in the big conglomerate kind of thing that I wish we could avoid, yeah. but would include CHIP reauthorization. I've been assured, and you would have a better feel for this than the people who are reassuring me, that in the Kansas circumstance, the money is still available, should take us through the end of the year, so while it's while the program is expired, the money is still in the pipeline in our state. That doesn't solve the problems of other states who are shutting it down, but it's not as dramatic consequence yet. And I don't know why it's taking so long for us, other than it takes us a long time to do most everything. So I'm for it and want to see it passed, want to see it passed in a timely fashion. Uh, I'm going to go have Thanksgiving uh, lunch with my family. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, elected officials, I suppose all, of, all human beings like to be surrounded by people who agree with them. I don't have that opportunity on an ongoing basis, but I do have respect for you and your views. And I appreciate many of you sharing them with me. Please buy a donut before you leave. Michelle, thank you.